you are live ma'am you can start now. Um, very good afternoon everyone um, this is kim scuddles uh, going live uh, on um, the occasion of the world uh, birth defects awareness month in fact we are into the subsequent month now and uh, we also have taken a small kind of um, uh, like i would say detour from the theme of uh, the birth defects prevention and awareness uh, team and we are going to discuss something which is very similar but uh, quite different from uh, birth defects the the classical way that we have been discussing last month we are going to discuss something which is also very very important um, the um, the area of genetic disorders that are picked up in a fetus in an unborn fetus as well as uh, in a baby after the baby's birth and uh, to discuss this we have with us dr jain krishna who is a consultant pediatric neurologist and he's a clinical geneticist so thank you for joining us dr jain yes, thank you so much for inviting me uh, any opening comments i think it's a common problem that everybody is facing i mean lot of genetic disorders being more uh, likely being diagnosed these days i think a lot of information is yet to be known even doctors know very little about this i think we can uh, put some light on few of the commonest issues we face day to day yeah um and um, of course this is me dr aparna and i've been um, kind of joining this uh, live show last few weeks and uh, we have with us dr rohini um she is our operations head and she is going to help us with uh, navigating the program today with some questions today um so um, genetic uh, disorders or deviations uh, in uh, the normal genome is not something that is new to all of us i'm sure a lot of you have heard and read about chromosomes about genes and how um, uh, most of our um, uh, the structure of the body the functions of various tissues various organs are principally governed by the genes in in our system and um, it is said uh, that a lot of us carry uh, subtle variations in the human genome uh, most of us may not even be aware of it and it may be so subtle that we do not realize that we actually carry a small mutation um, but uh, unfortunately we we do have um, severe or lethal variations in uh, genes which may present very early starting from in utero life and starting from uh, very soon after the baby is born Uh, so let's begin uh, with some questions. Question to Dr. Jain Krishna sir: What are types of antenatal genetic tests available? Okay, so uh, when we talk about antenatal tests, so we have to get through the normal scans, like uh, your gynecologist, whatever the tests are which are advised. We have antenatal screening scans which look for basic anomalies, and also you have serum markers wherein uh, these are the risk factors for few common chromosomal. anomalies like aneuploidies so uh, when you actually advise a genetic test actively because we have uh, a commonly done genetic test which is called nipt that is non invasive uh, prenatal testing so this is technically uh, not advised for everybody but uh, if you have a high risk pregnancy so when you actually call a high risk for uh, any uh, woman to have you know increase predisposition for genetic problems for example if you have uh, increased maternal age with increasing maternal age the chances of genetic uh, disorders especially chromosomal anomalies is uh, going to extremely escalate so that is the first risk factor and apart from that you also have recurrent abortions like previous miscarriage which is common uh, history and the third one if you have any of these screening markers abnormal for example you have an antenatal screen which is done and which had a uh, nuclear transfusion c abnormal or you have a serum marker which is abnormal that is elevated or decreased so you have various serum markers like easter egg or uh, pregnancy associated plasma protein you have hcg and you have various combinations of these uh, markers which predict the risk of uh, the true chromosomal aberrations so any of these abnormal serum reports actually will give you a clue that you know probably there could be a genetic disorder so in this condition you can actually go ahead and do an ipt so we'll discuss about an ipt in detail as well question to dr aparna ma'am how are the sample tests obtained for genetics um, so uh, obtaining samples from the pregnant mother is uh, something that is always uh, decided based on the timing of uh, pregnancy um so as dr jain told us um, uh, these days the role of nipt is something that has been coming up in a big way 
Um, so this is uh, sort of uh, considered as pre-implantation uh, genetic testing, wherein uh, in a non-invasive uh, fashion, um, the uh, cell-free fetal DNA can be taken from the maternal sample very early in uh, pregnancy. Um, if Anirudh can show us the PPT. Um, so, you know, we can kind of take the cell-free fetal DNA and this can be studied. Um, so, wherein um, you can kind of, uh, with 99% certainty, uh, rule out some genetic uh, uh, conditions. Um, so, this is uh, often done uh, when there are uh, some indications like extreme met uh, maternal age being a risk factor. If you are dealing with uh, an elderly pregnant uh, woman, then this is uh, something that is done. Or if there is abnormal test uh, report in uh, what we know as a dual marker in the first trimester or triple or quadruple marker that is done later on. So, this is something that is always uh, recommended. Or if there are multiple, um, um, you know, soft markers or even a single hard marker that is seen on an antenatal ultrasound scan. So there are various abnormalities that the fetal medicine experts would, do, would kind of screen you for during pregnancy, starting from the early pregnancy scan, which is called as an NT or NB scan, where an increase of the neck thickness of the baby is one of uh, important markers. Uh, likewise, uh, later in pregnancy, a targeted fetal imaging is done, uh, which is called as a TIFA scan or uh, anomaly scan, usually done at around 18 weeks of pregnancy. Um, so with, in which um, abnormalities in the structure of different organs can be identified. Again, there are some severe abnormalities and there are some soft abnormalities. So if, if there is a, a pregnancy where we can identify at least one significant or major abnormality or uh, more than um, two or more soft uh, markers or softer abnormalities, then again, we would go for this uh, screening. Now, the other types of invasive tests that are done to obtain uh, the DNA sample or genetic sample from the fetus uh, are uh, what is called as chorionic villus sampling, CVS, and, uh, and other two tests which go by the name amniocentesis and chordocentesis. So in CVS or chorionic villus sampling, which is done usually at around 11 weeks of pregnancy, around 10 to 12 weeks of pregnancy, it involves taking tissue from the placenta. Um, so this, is, uh, this contains what we call as chorionic villi, which are essentially going to have fetal DNA. But the problem with CVS is, uh, although it can be done very early in pregnancy and hence you also get the report quite early, um, there is a chance of miscarriage, which is around 0.5 to 1 percent. And uh, there is also a chance that we may get maternal DNA contamination. So when we do CVS, because it also um, brings some placental tissue, there could be maternal genetic contamination. So this will have to be kind of um, analyzed based on the maternal DNA samples which are taken concurrently. The other test is taking the amniotic fluid uh, which is present around the baby. So which will generally also have the baby's DNA. So again here we have uh, early amniocentesis which is performed uh, prior to 14 weeks and then the regular standard amniocentesis which is performed like between 15 to 18 weeks. Now, although amniocentesis is much safer, much more safer than CVS, it can be done under ultrasound guidance. Uh, a spinal anesthesia needle is introduced and amniotic fluid sample is taken and this is sent for DNA analysis of the baby. This has lesser chance of uh, maternal DNA contamination and this is usually done uh, between 16 to 18 weeks. The only little disadvantage is by the time you get the genetic uh, analysis, it may be already, you know, 21 to 22 weeks of pregnancy. So sometimes it's uh, pretty advanced in pregnancy and decisions for termination can become uh, more kind of uh, challenging. The other test which is not very often done and is technically more challenging is chordosynthesis, wherein the umbilical cord of the baby um, is uh, kind of invasively sampled using a needle and that sample is sent for analysis. Again, this is uh, something that is done between 18 to 20 or 21 weeks of pregnancy and hence it is more challenging and uh, the report might take another two to three weeks. So uh, there may be a considerable uh, time lag. So NIPT, amniocentesis, CVS chordocentesis. These are the four ways of taking samples. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, next question to Dr. Jain Krishna, sir. Why are they basically done? Is it recommended for everyone? Yeah, so I think uh, we have answered this because uh, we, we don't advise genetic tests right away in any pregnancy. So you should have a strong, because this is a major thing, you know, pre test counseling needs to be done to the family. Why are we basically doing a genetic test? So because the answers for that are going to be very significant, you know, to continue, continue the pregnancy or not. 
So uh, you need to know what uh, what problem are you looking at or what type of genetic test, and then you also need to know the outcome of whatever test you're doing. At. As I said, then NIPT should have some risk factors like increasing maternal age. More than 30, uh, the, the, every year the chance of uh, trisomies increases. So increased maternal age and history of miscarriages in the previous pregnancy, or you, even you have a uh, previous sibling affected with a genetic disorder, or you have any family member who is affected with a genetic disorder, clearly looking like a genetic disorder. So these are pure the risk factors. And apart from that, as Nan said, uh, any positive markers in the antenatal uh, um, serum testing or triple marker, quadruple, quadruple marker, any of these being positive or any abnormality of the slightest doubt in the antenatal scans from the radiologist or the fetal uh, medicine specialist and you can actually go for a genetic test you know NIPT actually gives you answers and also you need to know that NIPT only looks at few chromosomal aneuploidies it does not uh, look about all the problems so it's a common question from the patients you know if the genetic test is negative uh, will my uh, baby be perfectly well I mean the, will my baby not have any genetic problems the answer for that is actually no, because you're going to look at only chromosomal issues. So you're going to consult the patients in such a way that, you know, we have tested for these and there's very likelihood that these won't be there in your baby. But we did not test for all the genetic disorders. And uh, regarding what type of tests uh, are currently available, so we'll just discuss about that as well. I mean, it's a common uh, question that a clinician should also have because uh, genetic tests are very wide. If you see, uh, just to summarize how a genetic uh, material is made of, so we have millions of cells in our body, right? So our cell has a common uh, central point, which is called nucleus, and nucleus has a condensed genetic material. If you see the blue one, that is called chromosome, it is made up of billions and billions of genes, which is uh, compacted and condensed to make this ribbon-like structure, which is called chromosome. So if you cut down chromosome and you still look at it a microscope, so it depends on what uh, type of resolution you're looking at. For example, there are different tests available for chromosome and there are different tests available for testing DNA mutations. So uh, before actually getting a test done, you need to know like, you know, what are you suspecting in the baby? For example, if I have an antenatal scan which has a problem or a nuclear translucency being normal, abnormal or any quadruple or double marker being abnormal, so I, I would likely think that there is a chromosomal problem. So I would actually order a chromosomal test. So we'll also discuss what are the types of chromosomal tests and what are the tests to look at the DNA per se. So these are a few of the uh, concepts of basic gen genetic uh, material. How is it condensed in the body? Thank you, sir. Next question to Dr. Jain Krishna, sir. Can we identify all genetic disorders antenatally? Yeah. So this is a, a, a very uh, tricky question. So it depends on what test you have done. So for example, if I get a, a couple uh, who have come with a positive NIPT test, okay, or let's say negative NIPT test. So that basically tells you that, you know, the baby or the fetus does not have the trisomies which we have actually tested for. So NIPT looks for trisomies like 13, 18, and 21, and few more trisomies. So if that is not there, the test is gonna be negative, right? So it does not basically mean that, you know, the fetus does not have other type of problems. As I said, this test only looks at chromosomes. On the left hand of the picture, if you see, this is the chromosome we are looking at. So NIPT is only look, is going to look at chromosomes. The chromosomes look fine, but if there is actually a problem in the high resolution DNA itself, then this does, uh, test does not pick up. So it might be possible that NIPT is negative and baby ends up having a different disorder. So that's a different type of genetic disorder. So when you're actually counseling, so I would say that you no, know, NIPT is negative. So this less likely would have of having these chromosomal disorders. So if you're suspecting a single gene disorder, then you have to do a different type of uh, test, which has different different technique. Next question to Dr. Aparnamam and Dr. Jain Krishna, sir. When do we need to get genetic tests postnatally? Okay, should yeah. I begin? No. So, uh, Postnatally, uh, you know, uh, we suspect genetic conditions in some situations. Um, now, Dr. Jayanth has already told you the difference between um, chromosomal conditions that can be identified by the cross, ones that can be identified by a karyotyping, and the more, um, you know, um, chromosomal conditions at a smaller level, which are identifiable with a microarray. 
In contrast, problems at a single gene level would be identified by a, a genetic uh, sequencing test where you can either go for something called as a clinical exome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. Um, now, we suspect um, a, a baby to be possibly having um, a problem at a chromosomal level, usually on the basis of something called as dysmorphism. Dysmorphism means uh, the baby's appearance external appearance looking deviant from normal. For example, uh, you know, we have a certain configuration of the human face. So if you find something which is uh, um, significantly out of place, for example, uh, hypertelorism, that is the distance between the eyes being unusually wide, or if you find an abnormal slant of the eye, so a typical upward slant or mongoloid slant, which is seen in a common chromosomal condition called Down syndrome. Or if you see the ears of the baby being placed very low, which is called low set ears. So there are multiple such uh, deviations in facial structure or the formation of other organs like the formation of limbs, where, for example, the child could have um, a formation of an additional digit like a sixth finger or a sixth toe. Or there could be polysyndactyly. There could be multiple digits or fusion with or without fusion of two or three digits or you may have abnormalities in the formation of the bones in the limbs or formation of other critical visceral structures like the heart the liver spleen intestine uh, the genital organs kidneys etc so if you have a combination of one or more of um, the external facial physical appearance or internal structure of the organs itself uh, which is called as dysmorphism and particularly if it involves more than one organ system like for example facial and cardiac or cardiac and kidney or maybe kidney with limb abnormalities or a combination of multiple organ systems usually we suspect that this could be uh, a problem at the chromosomal level of course there are exceptions um, so in this condition we we would generally go for um, a karyotyping and in some specific situations where we only expect a part of the chromosome to be either deleted or absent or duplicated or present as an additional copy, we may ask for something called as a, a chromosomal microarray. In contrast, um, there are some other situations where we suspect a single gene problem. So usually these are conditions that present with abnormal functions of some critical enzymes that are required for the metabolism of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats that are provided to the baby. So here again, we have uh, two, three types. We may have uh, number one, micromolecular type of conditions wherein there could be enzyme defects responsible for digestion of proteins, carbohydrates, fats, resulting in accumulation of some toxic metabolites. Common examples are protein degradation defects like urea cycle disorders. So here the baby may present with uh, decreased activity, uh, lethargy, sometimes seizures, abnormal tone, or the baby may have involvement of some other organs, like for example, liver failure in a carbohydrate defect called galactosemia. So these are all, you know, some common, um, you know, small molecule defects where we think of single gene problems. Sometimes we may have energy failure defects. So here. Uh, the baby is unable to uh, form high energy phosphates, which are very critical for our metabolism, or they may fail to utilize them adequately. So one example is uh, mitochondrial uh, problems, where there may be problems in what we call as Krebs cycle or the basic pathway required for our energy utilization. So these babies may also present with lethargy. They may have low blood sugars. They may also present with seizures. The other type is um, something called as macromolecular problems where the babies may present slightly later um, with uh, a development delay or enlargement of some organs like liver spleen. A common example is um, Gaucher's disease, which is a lysosomal storage disorder. So if you see a child who is coming up with one or more of these problems, we may straight away think of doing 
um, uh, tests which help us to identify the problem at a single gene level because obviously a chromosomal test is going to not pick this up. So you may ask for uh, a specific targeted uh, sequencing if we are very sure that the baby's presentation fits with a certain disease. But more often we are not 100% sure and we may ask for uh, genetic sequencing involving uh, a similar spectrum of conditions which is often called as clinical exome sequencing and I request Dr. Jain. Yeah. So apart from this I think uh, from uh, say every um, genetic disorder has a clinical signature as ma'am said. So you have metabolic problems, you have uh, abnormalities, the baby is uh, not feeding well, the baby is not thriving well, the baby is not gaining weight. So there are uh, specific clinical symptoms which point towards a genetic disorder so then you get a genetic test done. Apart from that, you also have a uh, high suspicion of genetic disorders when there's actually a family history. And this is one thing uh, which is very important for everybody to know that uh, parental endogamy or consanguinity is uh, an extremely high risk factor for uh, consanguinous marriages. So that is so increased risk factor for single gene disorders. And uh, you know that India is one of the top countries wherein uh, there is a lot of consanguinity and uh, the incidence of uh, single gene disorders is extremely high because of consanguinity. So you also suspect uh, a, a, a disorder. As I said, the single gene is basically a small part of the gene which is actually defective and that gene has a critical uh, function, you know, affecting some uh, protein in the body which is causing all the symptoms of the baby. So if you have a family history like for example a maternal cousin or a paternal cousin having some sort of developmental issues or seizures, or some sort of metabolic disorder, or some sort of early uh, de demise or death. So that is also an important clinical factor. So whenever uh, such history is there in the family, it's extremely important that you tell it to the doctor who's treating because you know it could probably be related to the current uh, pregnancy and the current baby you are dealing with. So that is one thing parental uh, consanguinity and endogamy, which is extremely common in India is, is also important. And apart from that, uh, in particular regions and country, the carrier status, for example, in particular countries, particular states, the incidence of that genetic disease is very high. So, for example, uh, you must have heard about a common condition called thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. So, these are the conditions wherein you need uh, monthly blood transfusions for uh, forever in the night. So, the carrier status of these disorders are also common in India, particularly. So. Uh, I think we did not discuss about prenatal carrier testing. So this is one thing which is coming up uh, now. So back then uh, there was a lot of emphasis in different countries about newborn screening. So when the baby is born immediately we screen for a lot of genetic disorders. So this is called newborn screening. You know we are identifying the problem right at birth so that we can actually treat them early. But uh, the better concept even after this because there are a lot of genetic disorders even if you detect at birth there's not much you can do about them. Some of them are treatable and some of them are not treatable. So what if we actually, uh, this is called a primordial prevention, we actually prevent having a genetic disorder. So this concept has come up lately and this is going to be uh, the next standpoint in the next five years in almost all the countries. So this is called prenatal carrier testing. So in this, we basically test both mother and father. So we look for common, common the conditions like you know uh, which are common in that particular country and you look for the carrier status of the father and mother and if father and mother are both carriers of the same disease so that disease has high propensity of uh, occurring in the pregnancy so in that way you have to do a testing which is done amniocentesis and detect whether the gene is there or not if that gene is not there you can actually continue so with each pregnancy the the trans is like 25 percent if both mother and father are carriers for it and uh, when do you recommend it? Actually, we don't have a protocol in place currently for prenatal carrier testing, but we do have availability in India very freely. So I, uh, I mean, geneticists would recommend getting a prenatal carrier testing when you have consanguinity. And consanguinity is the main factor. And apart from that, if you have a clear-cut family history, anybody in the family has some genetic problem, which has been diagnosed, and that is also an indication to get a prenatal carrier test. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If I can just intervene and ask Dr. Yeah. Jain, you know, in the same context. So, what are the few common conditions where, you know, if you you were given a, a, a ch chance to kind of advise couples, you know, in the absence of the geographical uh, history yeah. and all that, what are the few common genetic conditions yes. where you would recommend prenatal yes. carrier? Yes, so that's an absolutely, I mean, a relevant question here because if you see in India, even if you don't have consanguinity, the carrier 
prevalence of certain diseases is extremely common. If you see, uh, I get a question from a lot of couples, you know, we are not uh, married in the same family, but why, why did my child have this thalassemia or sickle cell anemia? Now, you need to understand that because India has high prevalence of sickle cell and thalassemia. So in every country, there are some disorders which are common. So this is called carrier prevalence. So if that disease is common in, in particular area, I mean, regardless of your family history or regardless of your consanguinity, it is definitely recommended to get a carrier screening. So that is why, I mean, a lot of, actually, a lot of institutes and a lot of centers actually uh, advise to get uh, screened for thalassemia. We do a HPNC in the mother, and uh, we can also do a genetic test to actually confirm that as well. Which are the other common ones? Yeah, so apart from that, if you have different spectrum of disorders, for example, cystic fibrosis is also common in India, thalassemia, sickle cell anemia. And so there are a lot of neurological disorders also, especially uh, organic acid anemia is actually are rated one of the top uh, in India. So when you can actually, when you have consanguinate, you can actually screen for them. And uh, apart from that, uh, there are a lot of single gene disorders which are particularly common in particular communities in India. Uh, yeah. So that they can also be actually uh, given the advice of getting prenatal screening. Thank you, sir. Next question to Dr. Jayant Krishna, sir. Does the procedure of genetic testing involve any side effects? Yeah. So uh, it depends on the timing of testing. So if you if you take to the timing of testing, I think I'll actually show this slide. Yeah. So uh, if you you can actually do. A, a genetic test even before implantation. For example, uh, I have a, a couple with affected baby as a genetic disorder, and uh, the next baby also can have a genetic disorder. So again, I'll advise them to get a genetic test. So the now question is, when do I advise? So we could, the first option is the traditional option wherein you know you ask the parent to have a, a pregnancy plan, and in the first trimester, that is in the twelfth week, we do an amniocentesis and we do a genetic test in the amniocentesis. Amniocentesis is basically for the fluid around the baby, we put a needle, we don't touch the baby, we just take the fluid, we do a genetic test. So if that comes to be negative, we continue the pregnancy. If that comes to be positive, then we actually advise for termination. But in this concept, what happens is basically the mother has to bear for 12 weeks and you know, there's a loss. So that could actually be a mental trauma. So there's another method to actually prevent that. So when you have an affected baby, advise the parents to have a prenatal genetic testing. That is, uh, you can ask the parents to go for an IVF fuse the sperm and ova in the test tube and then do the genetic testing of that zygote. So if the zygote is negative for the genetic disease you are looking for, then only implant that in the uterus. And that basically confirms that you don't have that same genetic disorder in the next pregnancy. And then think at the same time, you are actually you know, avoiding the whole concept of 12 weeks and then terminating. So that is one uh, method. But if you see prenatal genetic testing also has a risk of actually rupturing the zygote. That can also cause you know, early miscarriages. So that is one problem. The same problem holds for uh, chorionic villus sampling as well. If the procedure is not done well, if, if the genetic material uh, while taking it, will injure a lot of cells, then that can also lead for miscarriage. However, the percentage of it is very less. It's like 1 to 3%. And when you come to newborn genetic screening, there are no side effects because that's the biggest advantage of genetic tests. You only take a blood sample of peripheral blood. So essentially, you don't have any side effects for that. But one thing you know, uh, you should know that before you send a genetic test, you have to know what are you looking for, because uh, genetic test is like a Pandora's box. Once you open it, you get a lot of answers. For example, if you're looking for something else, for example, uh, I had a baby who had the seizures. I was looking for genes related to seizures, and I did a whole exome sequencing, and it I got the gene which was responsible for seizure, but I also got a gene which is known to cause uh, carcinoma, breast carcinoma in that. So how do you go about with this situation? How do you counsel the parents? It's very uh, uh, disturbing for the parent to know that the child is going to grow up and have cancer. So before you order a test, that is the reason we have a, a session called pre pre uh, pre uh, pre genetic testing. That pre that pre test counseling. Before we order a test, we have to talk to the parents that these are the possibilities. We are doing this, and this could be the answers. We have to be ready for that. And at the same time, you got the report and you do a post test counseling. Wherein this is the problem, these are the implications for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question to Dr. Aparnama. How do we manage family after detecting genetic tests now? 
Okay, so this really de depends upon again the timing of the genetic test. So if uh, we have been kind of fortunate to identify a genetic uh, defect antenatally, um, you know, of course, this information should be kind of uh, uh, discussed with the couple, uh, giving all the necessary post-test uh, counseling information in terms of what would be our advice. Say, for example, um, uh, there may be a family who may think that uh, that a child having some kind of uh, deviations from normal uh, would be acceptable, and uh, uh, the couple might actually desperately want to have a child. So in this case, uh, one should not be too upfront in telling uh, the the only the problem problems associated with the genetic condition, the, the decision should be completely uh, left to the family um, and it should be an informed decision that they should be taking with their will and consent. Um, in case the couple decides to sort of continue with the pregnancy, then one uh, one would be obviously prepared to manage uh, the clinical implications of the genetic condition postnatally. So this is something that the geneticists, the pediatric neurologist, and the neonatologist uh, pediatricians work together as a team and manage. Now, in case the couple decides uh, to terminate the pregnancy, then um, you know uh, after the uh, appropriate intervention from the obstetrician for uh, termination, which should be done in a safe environment ensuring uh, clinical standards and uh, legal norms um, one also should go back and try to um, uh, kind of do parental uh, screening so based on the type of genetic uh, problem that has been identified for example if it is a single gene problem we have different types of inheritance uh, these are these are autosomal recessively inherited or autosomal dominantly inherited. You have some genes that can be carried in the uh, what we call as the sex chromosomes, X and Y chromosome. Um, again, they can be X-linked recessive or sometimes X-linked dominant. Uh, there can be some chromosomes, uh, some genes that can, can be carried from the mitochondrial genes, which uh, usually come only from the mother. So uh, based on the type of uh, inheritance, uh, the couple should be given a reasonable kind of uh, uh, a risk uh, estimation as to the likely chance of recurrence in the subsequent pregnancies once both of them have undergone screening. It's very important for uh, for us as uh, doctors, as clinicians, to remain uh, sensitive to the uh, perception and the expectation of the family. Uh, it is also very important to provide uh, reassurance, provide uh, different options that are available. For example, if we anticipate a high, very high risk of recurrence, which, which the couple might feel is unacceptable, uh, we may give them alternate options like uh, using a donor gamete, a donor ovum or a donor sperm, wherever it is clinically acceptable. It is also very important uh, to not allow any kind of blame game to come in. Um, you know, in in a country, a large country like ours, where um, you know there is there are a lot of differences in uh, education. There is a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of variation uh, in the uh, in the social uh, you know uh, situation from which the family might come and uh, uh, the gender roles. It is very important uh, to be sensitive to this expectation. For example, um, uh, if it is a mitochondrial gene mutation, which we know it is uh, maternally inherited. It is very important that the couple uh, doesn't uh, kind of assume a blame game wherein they may start blaming one parent for the condition. It is very important to be very sensitive and give a balanced solution to the family. Now, in case a genetic condition is diagnosed postnatally, which also is something that we often encounter. Um, so this is uh, this is a situation where often the family goes into a lot of social pressure. They may go into frustration. I mean, they may go into a denial mode sometimes. They may be extremely saddened with the pressure that the child has to live with a lifelong genetic diagnosis. Um, so it's very important that we are supportive to the family. We tell them all the realistic options that are available for correcting some components of the condition. For example, you may have a child with Down syndrome. Um, of course, we may not be able to reverse Down syndrome. That's a lifelong diagnosis. But there are a lot of things we can do. There may be a VSD or a cardiac condition which can be surgically uh, corrected or which may be corrected with an intervention procedure. Uh, there may be a gastrointestinal condition or an endocrine problem like hypothyroidism which can be easily treated with thyroxine supplementation. So we 
go ahead and offer all possible solutions for the treatable components of the genetic condition and continue to offer a lot of support to these families. Fortunately, now we have um, uh, online uh, um, platforms as well as a lot of offline groups. Like we have um, uh, follow-up groups for children, families with Down syndrome, where families can can kind of offer mutual uh, peer support to each other. So there are a lot of things that can be done uh, within our reasonable uh, domain. Uh, there are some things which we may not be able to do as well, and it's very important to realize these express these limitations as well. Dr. Yeah. Yeah, another common question is I think a lot of people uh, think that you know, genetic disorders cannot happen later in life. So I get a question like, you know, for example, if a 10 year old boy has some sort of problem and I say that it's a genetic problem, the question I come, I get from the parents, you know, the child was fine till now. So how is it possible that it's genetic? So I think that is the biggest misconception that people have, but genetic disorders can have onset at any age. So there are some genetic disorders which can start at 30 years, 40 years, because that particular gene has a protein which is functional and that gets prematurely terminated. A lot of mechanisms. So genetic disorder can happen at any time. So I think, uh, as ma'am said, we need to be sympathetic and empathetic to patients that know this has happened and put down all the possible uh, options you know, for treatment, for managing the palliation, and uh, now we are in a generation wherein uh, we have gene therapies as well and easily available in India as well. Gene therapy is not, it was once uh, a therapy which is only for the developed countries and uh, I think India has gene therapies for almost most of the diseases here. So there is definitely hope for genetic disorders in India. So what is the difference between a birth defect and a genetic disorder? So should I take it? Yeah. So birth defects is basically, as the na name says, the, the child, the baby is born with a defect. So birth defects could be multifactorial. So so that is the main concept here. So birth defects can happen because of a, an infection in the pregnancy. So this is called a uh, congenital infection. For example, in the first three months, the mother is exposed to some sort of infection like uh, CMV infection, rubella, uh, COVID, so all that can affect, or for example, the mother is a known case of hypertension, gestational diabetes, or the mother is on any uh, drugs, or smoke, or any antiepileptic drugs. So all of these can cause, you know, the baby to have birth defect. So that does not necessarily mean it is genetic. So genetic disorder is one of the cause for birth defects. So genetic is basically a problem in the genetic, uh, genetic genome or chromosomes. That is also, if I can just add another point, not all genetic disorders are going to also present with defects in the organs. So this is another thing that uh, you know all some families do ask us. We got all the scans during pregnancy, doctor. All the scans were normal. TIFA scan was normal, but now after birth, you're telling us that the baby is having a genetic disorder. How is this possible? So if you recall, we spoke about uh, the small molecule defects. Um, you know the inborn errors of metabolism, which may present with uh, poor feeding, lethargy. The baby may have convulsions. Um, the baby may have low blood sugars, and then we may come up with some uh, diagnosis like organic acidemia or urea cycle disorders. Now, if you do a scan of these babies, they have absolutely normal structure. So they have normal uh, scans. They have had normal um, ultrasounds throughout pregnancy. And even after birth, they may not have anything which is structurally deviant from what is normal. But they have um, uh, functional uh, problems uh, in proteins that are very critical for the assimilation of proteins, carbohydrates, fats, uh, etc. So this is also very important for us to identify. So there is a certain overlap of birth defects and genetic disorders, but there are um, uh, birth defects that can happen, arise without gene genetic defects, like uh, Dr. Jain mentioned, and there are also genetic disorders which may not have birth defects as a part of them. We have another question. Why is it that some families are more predisposed for genetic conditions than others? So as I said, uh, there are few, I think in, I mean, the concept comes from uh, Indian, I'll talk about the Indian context because some families, the major risk factor here again I have to talk, talk about is endogamy, that is uh, consanguinity. So in India, I think third degree consanguinity is fairly common. We don't have first as because that is an incest that is obsolete now. The th third degree consanguinity is common in a lot of uh, I mean, communities and even religions in India. So that is the biggest risk factor. The second one is that 
if if one of your family member already has a genetic disorder so there is a likelihood that this couple also is a carrier of the same gene so that that in, that also increases the uh, the predisposition for that particular genetic condition and it also depends on where in which country are you in as i said there are few genetic disorder common in for certain communities and certain countries as well for example thalassemia and sickle cell anemia are very common in india and africa and uh, even the united states has a lot of cystic fibrosis so it also depends on the epidemics and geography of, uh, of the condition as well are there any more questions okay, okay. so this is uh, a very relevant question so there is cure for genetic disorder as i said that's uh, also possible so what happens is basically there's one single gene which is defect so when i'm talking about single gene disorder for example a child has a chromosomal problem so chromosome problems are very big so i i talked about the chromosome is made up of a lot billions of genes in it right if the entire chromosome is missing or if you have an extra chromosome there's nothing much actually we can do. so that condition is not curable but that is only treatable or manageable but there are few disorders which are actually caused by single gene being defective the entire chromosomal makeup is normal there is only one gene which is defective and that is causing the entire disease so that can be technically be treated that is called gene therapy so this is actually the main concern about gene therapy is where it's it's pretty expensive so what we do is basically we replace that gene with the help of a virus so this is the concept of gene therapy so the answer for this is only few disorders which are genetic can be cured but most of them are actually treatable to some extent and manageable yeah so yes definitely so for example if i divide the genetic disorders into two types chromosomal disorders and single gene disorders yes definitely if i do a normal nipt and uh, other scans regularly so i can actually say with uh, decent confidence that you know the incidence of chromosomal anomalies will go down and just just because the nipd is negative as i said this we ca can't guarantee that your baby is going to be normal but if you have any other risk factors we can order more tests so that actually tells you that you know what are the risk factors of having so it can be prevented to some extent i think if you do the extensive genetic testing it can be prevented but still even if you do all type of genetic testing including whole exome sequencing in the fetus it is still not 100% guarantee so we are not in the state wherein you know we are making genetically engineered babies there is still chance that you know there could be a genetic disorder and one should also know that you know genetic mutation can happen any time so that can happen during pregnancy at the time of birth and even after birth so this is called a de novo mutation or a sporadic mutation so that basically can happen any time so technically there is no 100% guarantee that we can prevent but we can decrease the incidence to a great extent to almost like 80 to 90% if you do the right genetic test okay are there any advancements in genetic research or technology that offer hope for future prevention of treatment yes yes so the concept of newborn screening came after uh, the concept of this you know identifying this genetic problem right at the beginning during the birth so that for example as ma'am said there's an enzyme deficiency in particular protein or an energy metabolism so that enzyme can be replaced right at birth so you don't have any consequences of that deposition of that toxic chemical so there are few disorders where you know if you get it at newborn period and identified really well and that can have good amount of treatment and as i said there are few disorders wherein gene therapy is available so gene therapy is cure like you know the gene is defective and you are actually replacing that gene with a healthy gene so in that condition it can be cured so it depends on what condition you are talking about how do genetic disorders affect child's development and quality of life yeah so uh, there are a lot of genetic disorders which actually affect brain so if i talk about there are few genetic disorders which do not affect brain for example cystic fibrosis for example there are genetic liver disorder there are genetic intestinal disorders so they not affect the child's i mean neurodevelopment but uh, they can for example if you have a neurological genetic disorder for example uh, any genetic disorder which is causing low iq or seizures so that can actually affect uh, affect the child's development and quality of life because the development of the child won't be normal 
the child will have significant morbidity and because of seizures the quality of life is going to be up down the child will be on a lot of medications a lot of support they cannot go to a normal school it does have a lot of implications on the quality of life of both the child as well as parents and entire family what is the cause of genetic testing okay it's a very uh, relevant question so we have a lot of genetic tests available currently so i would approximately say the cause of all the genetic tests i mean uh, the basic karyotyping is is the least expensive one you can get it done i mean less than 3000 and even you get it from government centers at 1000 rupees also and if you get a chromosomal microarray it's somewhere between 10000 to 12000 and the next is a expensive one that is next generation sequencing in that you have different ranges of what are you looking for you have clinical exome whole exome and whole genome clinical exome costs around like 10 to 12000 whole exome coming up to 15 to 16000 and whole genome is costing up to 40000 so one for one patient so that is the pro band again if that's possible if you have to do for the parents it's going to be costing double and triple i think the cost of genetic tests have come down recently and in back then 5 years back it was very expensive and also uh, they often run research projects looking at some uh, specific genetic disorders wherein if we are fortunate yeah. we may be able to do it yeah. for um, like much lower uh, prices i think uh, those uh, who are uh, kind of uh, looking or who require the such tests uh, always can reach out to their doctors um, pediatric neurologists clinical geneticists like dr jain who generally be in close uh, contact with the genetic labs and would be able to help you out with the best possible costing as well what is the long term outlook for children in specific yeah it again depends on what type of genetic disorder you're looking at for example if a genetic disorder has some sort of uh, specific treatment like enzyme replacement so then the outlook is going to be pretty decent but if you have a genetic disorder which has very little uh, treatment implications then the outlook of the child is going to be very bad throughout life so what's in facts yeah <laughs> so are there any government programs or initiatives in india yeah so there is an organization in india which is called the uh, indian association of rare disorders and uh, what is more important is that there are communities and societies for each disorder so we have a thalassemia society we have in every city you have a community of that particular disorder i mean if it is not that rare enough so we have communities for duchenne muscular dystrophy we have communities for thalassemia we have for sickle cell anemia even we have leukodystrophy community in india so i mean the communities are very important and uh, uh this uh, government funding for a lot of communities as well but uh, i think india is not in that point where you know the genetic testing and the support and treatment for all genetic disorders is not free and funded by government i think i think it's uh, under request i think i think indian government should start funding for more of genetic disorders i mean i think uk and uh, a lot of european countries have from the point of diagnosis from the genetic testing till the treatment is funded by the government fund like for example nhs covers by everything in uk but in, unfortunately in india right now we are not uh, supported for the treatment but not supported by any government initiatives if you have a child with a genetic disorder what is the risk of future children having so it depends on the genetic disorder for example if you have a chromosomal disorder so the next pregnancy the recurrent risk is going to be pretty high for example if the mother has some chromosome aberration in every pregnancy you have increased uh, risk of having uh, miscarriages when they come to single gene disorders that is mendelian disorders autosomal recessive which is very common in india so the chance of next child having is 25% so don't get it wrong actually it's not like if you have four children you have one affected child it's not like 25% of your children it's like with every pregnancy you have 25% risk of getting a single gene disorder which is autosomal recessive but if you have conditions like autosomal dominant disorder like achondroplasia marfan's disease neurofibromatosis tuberculosis the, the chance of getting is 50% with each pregnancy so that is uh, half it's pretty high if my newborn is diagnosed with genetic disorder what kind of specialist should i see okay so i think the newborn will be picked up i think you should see a neonatologist per se and i think neonatologist should be I mean, they are well enough uh, to pick up. If it is not a genetic disorder, they are going to treat it. But if it looks like a genetic disorder, as Ma'am said, we have characteristic bits of dysmorphism or constellation of symptoms which look like you know multiple organs are involved. The child does not look normal. There is history of consanguinity. There is background of fetal losses. With that background and the 
the child's examination. If you're definitely thinking it's genetic disorder, you can actually refer to a clinical geneticist. Will my child be able to live independently as an adult? I mean, if your child does not have a genetic disorder, you can live independently. But uh, I think if the, the question says if you have a genetic disorder, I think there are a lot of genetic disorders. If you see, uh, even Down syndrome patients actually can live independently. There are, uh, there are a lot of patients, a lot of Down syndrome patients who come up to graduation and do their own job as well and marry and have kids as well. So again, it depends on what type of genetic disorder you're talking about. There are a lot of genetic disorders which have low amount of clinical symptoms. They can have a normal life expectancy. My kid got seizures when he is 16 months old due to high fever. It may affect anything. Okay, I think uh, uh, you're talking about uh, a febrile, febrile seizure. seizure. Yeah, so febrile seizure has multifactorial etiology that is primarily not genetic. So I I don't. It is very less likely that your child will be you know, affected in future. But he's very likely to have more seizures with less than five years. But it's not going to affect his development if it is febrile seizures alone. So any concluding messages, uh, Dr. Jayant? I think yeah. we'll, we'll finish with a concluding okay. message. Yeah, I think the biggest message I always wanted to give to the, I, I got a very good platform to do that. Uh, I think um, Indian government is spending, if you see spinal muscular atrophy and machine muscular dystrophy, one injection for spinal muscular atrophy costs 20 crores. And it is not a treatment of, it's not the final treatment for spinal muscular, it's only gonna get better. And if you see a lot of filmmakers and directors actually promoting for contribution of that. So if you see the basic thing is that if you're spending 20 crores for one disease for one child, why can't we focus on consanguinity? I think uh, a lot of people in rural still uh, think that you know consanguinity is something which is important. So a lot of people in India actually think that inbreeding actually, for example, if there's one particular caste, they don't marry with a different caste that is actually also an endogamy so you're trying to do endogamy in the same community the chances of increasing the same genes which are defective so that is consanguinity endogamy in the same is going to increase risk for genetic disorders i think if consanguinity alone is targeted in india with a lot of publicity and a lot of uh, education it itself can decrease the burden of genetic disorders in india yeah, so Dr. Jayant is talking about not marrying within close family members. So uh, please watch out, guys. If uh, if uh, you know if you know friends, family members who are uh, planning to get married yeah. within close family, you know it kind of puts uh, uh, the the baby at a high risk of developing genetic disorders. So as soon as I say that to a patient, you know they also come up saying that you know my brother got a consanguineous marriage. Their kids are absolutely exactly. fine. So what are we talking about? So, see, it's like I'll give an example that, you no, know, if the chances of you having an accident are more with when you don't wear a helmet. So, it does not necessarily mean that if you don't wear a helmet, you'll definitely die. So, the chances of you getting a genetic disorder is extremely high when you have a consanguineous marriage. So, if the general population risk is around one person, if you're a consanguineous couple, the chance of child getting is 6%. So, that is almost increased by 6%. So, that you need to know the chances are high that not necessarily that definitely will happen. Uh, also, as as long as you know, as far as we've been discussing about prevention, like by by means of prevention of consanguineous or marriages within close relations, and then Dr. Jain told to us about uh, carrier testing, which is which is a very in concept, where you know young couples, uh, uh, those of you who have been reading across so much so much of information from Google and from all the available social media content that you have, uh, you know if you do know that uh, your family or uh, you may be at, at a higher risk of a certain genetic problem. There's absolutely no harm in going ahead and doing a carrier testing because this is something that you can, uh, which can help you to take an informed decision uh, in this very important step in your life. Uh, but also, you know, as a neonatologist, I would also like to emphasize that, you know, um, a diagnosis of a genetic disorder doesn't mean the end of life. Uh, you know, we, we come across so many families who become so frustrated and who completely give up hope and uh, sometimes go to the point of almost abandoning the child simply because uh, the baby or the young child was diagnosed to have a genetic disorder. A lot of us who may be apparently um, genetically kind of normal or who may not still be aware of, uh, you know, 
the uh, the variations from normal genome that we ourselves may be harboring, uh, you know, may may always uh, go on to have. Uh, a postnatal event that may significantly impair our life. For example, someone may have an accident and can have a fractured leg. Someone may develop a stroke and one, one side of the body may stop functioning. Uh, would that make our family stop taking care of us? Uh, that is something that you must ask ourselves when, when uh, as a parent, you are faced with this uh, you know, unfortunate situation. Right? We do not want anyone uh, to be in that situation, but if at all, uh, uh, there is a baby who has a genetic problem that doesn't also mean the end of life. Uh, there are so many things, so many components of the disease that we may we may be able to partially or completely manage or, or perhaps cure. If there is possibility of gene therapy or enzyme replacement therapy, the quality of life in some subsets of these populations of affected children may reach a fairly normal, reasonable expectancy as well. So uh, it's also not important to be too quick in losing hope. So I think with those messages, um, we thank you all for joining us today on this live session. And we hope to be um, hope to be joining you very soon next Tuesday with another interesting session. I also thank uh, Dr. Rohini and Anirudh from our team for helping us uh, putting this session on board. Thank you so much. Thank you.